So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's, it's getting better. So, so let, let's begin. And, and I think you know, what I want to talk to you about today is creating abundance. And, and I'm going to get into what that means in just a moment. But really, what, what I, where I want to start is right here. And if you can't tell, that blurry little image, um, this is a surfer, right? And, you know, everyone, you know, surfing is, is something that's happening all over the globe. Um, and, and the point of this, and I think the point of what Joe was saying, that context is really important. And do you understand the context that is around you? Because if you are surfing, it looks very different like this versus this. Now, this is a 100-foot wave. So this is a you know, roughly five to six foot tall person. This wave is eight to 10 stories high. Um, these, this is the stuff of legend. These waves that are out there in the ocean that are this size break uh, container ships in half. Um, the, the surfer here, um, if they don't understand their context, their day is probably about to get really, really bad. Um, but if you do understand the context and what is going on, uh, surfers like this have opened up uh, new avenues and new doors within the surfing industry. They've come up with new ways to ride the wave. Uh, they've invented things like tow riding, different kinds of rescue, and things that actually people never thought were possible. Now, you might be asking, what does all this have to do with, certainly with enterprise and business, um, and I want to talk to you a minute about the context of what's happening um, in, in the U.S. economy, but also globally. Um, and, and let's take a look and look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, this is the 30 most widely held stocks uh, in the U.S., and this is what it looked like back in 1896. And the context here was really agriculture and commodities, right? And you can take a look at this list of companies that was, uh, that's up here from cotton you know, down to lead, uh, leather, rubber, and then if you fast forward, oh, and I, I'd actually, before, before we get to the next age, I should mention I'm from Bar Harbor, Maine. Uh, we are an island. Uh, we are the second largest island after Long Island on the East Coast. Uh, we're not quite as populous as New York City with a year-round community of 10,000 people. Uh, we do have about two to four million tourists, however, that come through in the summertime, but even this little town, and, and it was, originally it was called Eden, um, even this little town is subject to the context of the broader economy, right? And so this is what Bar Harbor looked like back in 1896. And you can see it's a pretty pastoral setting. Uh, the first tourists were coming up to that area to visit what is now Acadia National Park. Um, and if you fast forward, if the clicker goes forward here, let's see, there we go. Uh, if you fast forward to 1928, you can see that retailing, uh, manufacturing and radio were now emerging. And you can look at the list of companies here, um, some, some that are, you know, went out of business recently, General Motors, uh, Chrysler, you know, Bethlehem Steel, these were huge companies in their day, um, and many of them have, have gone by the wayside because they didn't understand really that the context was changing. And again, back to Bar Harbor, here you have a Nash auto dealership, um, you know, that was, that was prevalent at the time. Now, if you fast forward up to 2014, um, right now it's knowledge and service industry, right? And, these, and you can see that the, all those, many of those names and most of those names, in fact, are gone off the list. And again, if we look at Bar Harbor, um, we have indeed a huge tourist industry, as I mentioned, two to four million people coming through a year, as well as we have uh, bio labs. And in fact, the Jackson Laboratory uh, they make m custom designed mice for medical research. So if you need a balding diabetic mouse that has a twitch, they can make one of those for you. Um, and people and they export their mice all over, all over the world. Now, the, the real question here is though is what is next? And just as a, as a question here, does anyone, can anyone, did anyone realize how many companies have made it through all of those changes? And when there's only one company that has survived from 1896 all the way through to 2014 to continue to be listed. Does anyone know what it is by chance? Yeah, it's GE. Um, and so here you can look at the creative destruction that has gone on in the economy, much like that wave crashing down. Um, and you can see here I've highlighted, uh, here's GE in blue, 
And they've made all three cycles in American tobacco, uh, made two in Standard Oil, now ExxonMobil has made, has made one shift. But really, only one company really understood how the context is changing all around them and was able to move forward through these very different economic ages. And so, as I was saying, you know, the real question here and what most people want to know if you're in enterprise is where, not where have we been, but where are we going? So this question of what is next is key. So let's take a look at a couple of things. Um, this very easy to follow graph. Um, down here you have, this is put out by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, so a lot of large corporations as part of their Vision 2050 report. And the idea here is that they were trying to figure out how can we meet the needs of humanity within the bounds of what is ecologically possible on the planet. And so down here you have the UN Human Development Index, and you, where you want folks on this index is to be over here on the 0.8 to the 1.0. And that is that they have, you know, they have a higher education, health care, uh, long life, income, those kinds of things. Um, and that is contrasted over on this axis over here with the number of hectares, hectares per person that is available on the planet. And so you can see the biocapacity in 1961 was about four hectares per person, and the biocapacity in 2006 is around two. And then what all these little dots are are different areas of the world. And so you can see Africa here is this orange, and the countries in Africa are right down here, and the North American countries are here in um, green, and you can see the, uh, the, they're living high on the human development index, but way out of what is possible if everyone was to live that way on the planet. And uh, the Asian countries are here in mustard, and you can see those as well, that kind of is a bigger spread. But the idea here is, if, if the entire world is living up here on this high human development index, but they're exceeding the carrying capacity of the planet, we have a big problem. Um, and so what is happening is people are realizing this and everyone is racing to get down to this blue box. And so how do you do more with less? How do you have people living the lives they want to lead, but uh, have it being done within the biological uh, capabilities of our planet? Now, so this is one look at it, and this is, you know, gets to the notion of sustainability, and, uh, and is frankly, you know, can be really depressing if you, if you look at this long enough, because it does not look like we're heading on a good road. But, you know, that is not the only future that is, that is possible. Um, another way to look at this is, um, is this graph here, where you have business performance happening over here, and this is time. And so here you have the agricultural, industrial, and information ages, and each time you go through this period of chaos as you switch over. And some folks think we're right here in this new period of chaos. And if you are an enterprise, what you want to be asking yourself when, you're, when you look at this, if you think back to the beginning of the internet age, um, you know, and, I, and I teach uh, undergrads mainly, but also MBA students, and now it's getting to the point where they don't remember the beginning of the internet age. So thank goodness this audience is a little more mature um, and, and can think back to when there was no internet. But if you were a business and ask yourself, what would have happened 15 years ago if you just felt the internet or the information age was a fad? How would that have changed what you did or didn't do? And probably you wouldn't still be around today. So what is this next age we're heading into? Um, and I would say it's the age of abundance. Um, people have also said this is the age of sustainability. Um, and and I want to, we can talk a little bit about those two terms, but to me, when you're talking about sustainability, you often enter this, this huge language gap that I'll get into in a, in a moment. But the age of abundance, it talks about business systems that are in harmony with Earth's life support systems, so you have outstanding uh, social, environmental, and economic results. Now, the radical, forward-thinking company that I got this slide from was Staples. Right? So this is something people are thinking about at all diff different levels of the corporation. Um, and I also want to be clear that I am talking about here not only for-profit companies, but nonprofits, social enterprises, large companies, small companies. And I'm using, when I, you hear me talking about companies or enterprise, I'm using that term writ large. I do not discriminate of, with, between nonprofit and for-profit organizations, social and traditional entrepreneurship. Now, how many of you, I'm sure many of you have heard of the triple bottom line, right? And this notion of 3P, people, profits, and the planet. Um, but what happens is when you talk about this in a business context, 
uh, and you're talking to his uh, chief financial officer, they glaze over. They don't understand what, what you mean, and they kind of assume that you're a, you know, a, a kind of a hippie or a tree hugger, and, um, and they don't, and these terms are really amorphous. So let me break it down for you when, what the, the way it works with, uh, with the three Ps. So on the people side, what you are trying to do is, is really, there, there is a whole myriad of things underneath these, but essentially you're trying to either improve the workplace, build your community, or solve social issues. And, and you can lump numerous efforts under, under these sort of meta categories. On the planet side, you are trying to reduce waste, even better, use waste as a resource, or regenerate natural capital. And if you can imagine for a moment a business that is actually regenerative in creating positive social um, and environmental outcomes, then but what does this mean for profitability? And you know, keeping in mind that business is the most ubiquitous activity on the planet, and I would argue probably are the current method of destruction out there, that business really needs to understand how can I do these other things but help my bottom line. And if you can do that, that is a gigantic lever that you can pull on. So on the profit side, this is really about three things, reducing risks, cutting costs, and growing sales. Now, if you're talking to that chief financial officer or a chief executive officer, that it, those things are music to their ears. And what you can have is these things operating in consort to create a virtuous cycle where it's reinforcing. Now, I'm sure you don't believe me at this point, um, and let me show you how this has played out and also a model that, that can take you there. So a couple of things, this language gap that I mentioned. When business people hear sustainability, they often assume it's a zero-sum game. So I am trading off profits for environmental or social benefits. And in fact, not everybody feels that way. And the Harvard Business Review back in 2009 did an article on how green will save us. And so they start talking about, in that article, that sustainability is the mother load of innovation um, that can yield both bottom line and top line returns. Um, and so the smart companies and the ones that are looking forward understand this. But a recent study by MIT and the Boston Consulting Group found out that even in companies where people understand this, they don't have a methodology to do this. And so I'm going to show you a model in a little bit to bring this together and merge both strategy with the ethos of sustainability to try and help that out. So um, why does it matter? And so what we're moving from is this old notion of risk mitigation. Like, I only worried about the environment because I was about to get sued, right? To how do you cut costs and grow revenue? Now, the, the place I got this slide um, is this odd combination of, of these two groups. The Carlyle Group, which is one of the largest private equity firms in the US, that not necessarily known to be for their benevolence, right? They are in it to make money. And they teamed up with the Environmental Defense Fund, um, which prior uh, in their history is really known for suing companies. And what the Environmental Defense Fund has figured out is that if we work with people like the Carlisle Group, we can really move mountains. Instead of trying to just sue them, let's help them figure out how they can make more money and have these environmental benefits happening. So definitely a, a strange marriage. Um, so let's look at some of the evidence in terms of financial returns. So uh, there's, a, there's a group that does, um, that is uh, into a conscious cap, what they call conscious capitalism, and it's really a stakeholder-centered approach to capitalism, and they looked at companies over a period of 2006 to 2011, and they found that while during that time the S&P went up 157%, the, these firms of endearment, as they call them, or these stakeholder-centered companies, went up almost 10 times as much. Now, who are these companies? Some of them you're probably pretty familiar with, um, and you can see them listed here. Now, another study that was put out uh, by Harvard looked at uh, the stock market performance of um, what they called high sustainability companies, and these are companies that had been involved in sustainability for a long time, since the early 90s, versus low sustainability companies. And you can see here the dollar performance from 1992 to 2010. One thing I would like to point out is you can see right here in 2008, um, when you know, the global economy was collapsing all around us, um, that these companies still continued uh, to actually outperform their, their less sustainable peers. So again, saying that, is, in fact, this is not a zero-sum game, and the, the people who are 
doing this, some argue they are actually going to outcompete the folks who aren't doing this. And why is that? Because, you know, in business you have this thing called a, a competitive advantage, and it's what do you do uniquely well, um, and how do you constantly innovate and come up with new ways of doing things and pleasing your customers? And in fact, when you look at this competitive advantage as a result of this, um, it's abundant. You know, all of the things that you see up here are things that uh, businesses would kill to do every day. The other thing that's happening is if you are into sustainability or abundance, you are constant, the bar is constantly being raised, right? What we thought was sustainable five years ago now would almost be seen as a bad actor. So you are constantly pushing things forward. Your employees are more engaged. Uh, they are interested in what is happening. If you talk to the folks at Staples or GE, they say their, their most involved employees are the ones who are out there doing this kind of work because guess what? No one wants to go to work in the morning and destroy the planet or destroy society. It's a lot more motivating for your people and your employees that work there if you're going there and trying to make good things happen. So let's take a look now. I want to take you through a process that I use with businesses uh, to look at this and introduce you to a new model. So the first thing that you need to do for a company, and again, just a reminder, we are going to be merging the strategy, <clears throat> the strategy world, and so I'll be talking about some business with the sustainability piece. Okay? Everybody, everybody with me? All right? Okay. Um, too fast? We're doing okay? Okay. All right, just let me, I can't see you because these lights are totally blinding, um, but, but let me know anyway, so figure, figure out a way. All right, so the first thing that you want to think about if you are an executive is what is the purpose of your company's existence? Um, and in fact, for those of you who aren't in industry, every company when they started, it was generally because they were trying to solve some sort of problem, right? And you have, the, there's this mantra within the sort of traditional business world of maximizing shareholder value, um, which is sort of the old way of looking at things. Um, and because if you only focus on profits, much like that surfer in the beginning, that is all you see is this little narrow bubble. The other thing about that triangle that we talked about is that opens up multiple, multiple points of view. So go back to that. What is the purpose? Why do you exist as a company? What is the problem? you are trying to solve. You have to figure out what are your strengths. Um, Michael Porter from Harvard Business School invented a value chain um, which has been in use since the, um, the 70s and 80s um, and it is a great model and it helps break these down but it is not what we need today. Um, and what we need today is a variant of that and so what you want to understand is what are your strengths as a company. And so what you see here are all of the processes that any service or production company goes through. And so all companies have these primary activities. Uh, you have inbound, where you get stuff in from the outside world. In operations, you're making something. Um, outbound is getting it out to your customers, right? How do you distribute your goods? Um, marketing, we all know, we all know about. So how do you market it, get it out to people? What is your service like after you sell something, right? And then finally, what, what we've done here is we've added another term, unsold production. Um, and what, what this replaces is the idea of waste, right? All waste is is stuff that you are producing as a company or an organization and you are not selling it, right? And so in business terms, that is a very, in, instead of some, being something like, oh, it's waste, we just need to get rid of it, you're saying, no, it's actually stuff that we're making and there may be some sort of source of value there, but we just haven't figured out how to capture it. So when you put these all together, um, you create this kind of cycle that, that does a couple of different things. First of all, uh, with the unsold production piece here, you are linking up uh, your, your processes at the end of production going back to inbound and trying to find ways to close that cycle. Um, also, um, being circular, you, you continue to grow it, and instead of being linear and stretched out, here you can have different connections between different parts of this cycle. And so it can be reinforcing from a number of different perspectives. Now, let, let's, let me give you an example of how this works. So let's look at a, a giant company, uh, Walmart, which I'm sure most everyone has heard of in one way or the other. Um, and so Walmart, what happens is every company has competitive strengths. So Walmart, what they're so good at um, is really the inbound, 
right? They bring stuff in, they manufacture, uh, most, their companies manufacture them mostly in China, um, and then they're outbound. They're all about sourcing and distribution, and they, have, they do that like nobody else on the planet. Um, Whole Foods, which is a natural and organic food store in the US and also in the UK and in Canada. Um, and if you ever have, are in the United States and you like food, go to Whole Foods. It is a temple to food. Um, you go in and it is beautiful. And there is the old expression, you eat with your eyes, and that's what the store is all about. You go in and uh, you, know, the, you walk into a big array of flowers, the vegetables lovingly stacked up. It's just gorgeous. And they charge, and they charge you for that gorgeousness. Um, but what they, where they emphasize is their operations and also, oddly enough, in unsold production. So most in the grocery store sector, what happens is uh, the waste is a huge problem. In Whole Foods, what they do is they gather their produce and their other products before they're about to uh, expire, and then they turn those into a home meal replacement, uh, basically prepared foods, and you can sell those at, at a higher premium. Um, so they have a whole other revenue stream that other grocery stores don't have. The other one I want to look at just briefly is Zipcar. And again, we're still in the strategy piece here, so if you're wondering what does this have to do with sustainability, we're, we're going to get there. Just hang on for another moment. So Zipcar is a car sharing program, and they operate, um, they operate globally, uh, mainly again in the US and uh, Canada and Europe. Um, and what their, where their competitive strengths lie is both in marketing and the service after the sale. Right? And so they've taken something which was an ownership experience, like I have to own a car to drive it, to giving people the, the service of being able to drive a car. And so you can see here that so every company and every nonprofit organization or service organization has different areas of competitive strength. So you need to understand what is it you do well before going on, because what we're trying to do here again is link up to the strategy. So now that we understand what we do well, we bring it back to these pieces here, and we try to maximize what we're doing for people, profit, and the planet. Now, the way we do this, um, oh, actually, before I go there, so this is what the abundance cycle looks fully, fully blown out. And so what is happening is you're examining not only what you do strategically well, but what are the impacts on the planet and how can you reduce waste, uh, use waste as a resource, how can you solve social issues, and in turn, at each stage of this cycle, how can you increase profitability or make the company stronger? And that is how you link up and, provide, and get across that language gap that exists. Now, to help you think about what you do, so now we're not just going to throw you to the wolves and say, figure this out. Uh, we've come up with about a dozen or so tactics. And what, what these are from is looking at what our companies are doing all over the world. And where we tested this, we looked at the auto industry first, right? Because the auto industry is enormous. Um, and the, actually, the five largest companies in the auto industry, if you put all of their sales together, it, it would be equal to the 20th largest economy on the planet. All right, just to give you a sense of scale, size and scale. And so we wanted to see, are people really innovating in this space that is so huge, um, and, and can this be done here? And in fact, we found out that people are doing this all over the place within the auto industry. Um, and so, and I won't go over all of these, but so they're using their unsold production as a resource. And here you have a vehicle to grid charging. Um, they're sharing economy where you have people uh, like relay rides who are doing peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Uh, this is a new truck from Walmart that gets uh, three or four X the, the, uh, the normal fuel efficiency of a truck. Uh, building natural capital, this is a, a guy, Nick Harris, who's created a drop-in fuel called butanol um, that's made out of food waste. Um, you can see here, this is a London, uh, the bike highway that's being proposed in London. Um, biomimicry, so here you have the bullet train uh, in Japan that was actually inspired by the hummingbird's beak. And, right, and can we look to nature for inspiration? Uh, looking at the solutions economy, so do you have to sell someone a product, or can you sell them the ability to do what they want to do at the times they want to do it? Um, and so this is a, a, an example of the pod cars uh, that are taking place all in some different places. Also, uh, Micro Enterprise. This is a company in the Philippines that is, uh, they're called Clean Engines. And what they're doing is they're making, uh, they're making a, a kit, <coughs> excuse me, they're making a kit for uh, motorcycles that can be changed. 
uh, to change them out to make them more efficient, more fuel efficient, and people can save money as well as reduce pollution. Um, at the base of the pyramid, there are companies working on different kinds of cars, like this one powered on compressed air. Um, crowdsourcing, both money and ideas. This is the Fiat Mio, the world's first cloud, uh, crowdsourced car. Uh, new kinds of entities are coming up. This is a streetcar company uh, based out of Portland, Oregon, that's bringing those back. Um, and the service profit chain, Tesla, for those of you who know it, so they've taken you know, this kind of stodgy idea of an electric car and made it the most beautiful, souped-up sports car that you can buy, and have also changed around the whole way that the, the process for purchasing a car works. And then regenerative marketing. Can you use marketing as a way to help uh, solve social issues or build natural capital? And see, here you can see the city bikes in New York. So I guess I am gonna go through all of those. Um, so, the, and two companies uh, in Japan that, uh, that are doing this and using multiple strategies here and multiple tactics. Uh, Toyota has unveiled the, uh, the iRoad, and this is a, uh, it takes, it incorporates a number of these different tactics so you don't own these. They're designed that you pick them up at the commuter station and they get you the last mile. Um, and, and so you get it like a zip car um, and, you, and, you can, uh, and you can use that instead of having to drive in and it makes the link that is missing between uh, public transportation and getting you to where you want to go. And then Honda, interestingly enough, just recently unveiled this, and they're talking about um, moving beyond the auto industry into, into the home, because they see the home as a fuel cell, and your home will be charging your car, and when your car is parked there, you'll be getting uh, energy off of your vehicle. And so they're looking at how do you bring this out beyond you know, where, their, where their core competency was or is. So you can see these tactics, and what you can do with these tactics, suddenly you have a way of talking to people and looking at your business in, in new and different ways. And so, um, and what this does, and what is key in business, and you hear all the time, innovation, everyone's talking about innovation. You know, how do we innovate? How do we remain innovative? We've gotten so large, we wanna you know, be this new, innovative, entrepreneurial company. And what innovation is, it's about perspective, right? And the gift of many entrepreneurs is, they see the same things that we all see, but they see it in a different way. And so by asking a whole new set of questions, you're expanding your viewpoint and you're, and you're bringing about all kinds of innovation. So here you can see this is uh, from a CEO of a hyper-competitive company that is talking about um, their efficiency and then when they were working on sustainability issues, um, they, they talked about how they thought the CEO was totally insane when he brought these up and what did this have to do with anything? And as a result, uh, they started seeing things uh, in, a whole, in a totally new, new way. Um, and they underestimated, and this is what happens all of the time. People underestimate the financial benefit they'll get. And they found, in this case, if they simply reduce their waste, uh, they would save costs and then they could pass that on to the customer and, and save more. The person who this quote is from is Doug McMillan. And what he was talking about uh, was Sam's Club, right? And we talked about Walmart, which is a Walmart company, and we talked about how efficient they are on the inbound. Um, and the particular item he was talking about was this milk jug, right? A milk jug, it's not, you know, we're not talking, this is not rocket science, right? And what this is, the way this milk jug is built um, in, the, in the US, um, what happens is when you get a, a gallon of milk, they put four of them in a crate, and you have a crate which is about this thick all the way around, and, and this milk jug doesn't need a crate. It's got enough support in it that you can stack them on a pallet and wrap it up and not have to have a crate. And so what that does is, for if you can now imagine an 18-wheeler or a, a large tractor trailer full of these things, um, it makes more space, they can get more load in there, and they saved about $8 million in transportation costs as a result. And again, the tactic they're using here uh, is this radical resource productivity, and they're, they're making themselves more productive doing more with less. Another company, not surprising, GE, who is the only one who survived all those different cycles, uh, they have an eco-imagination uh, division. Right? And all that division focuses on is how do you do more with less? How do you create the solutions for, uh, to make the world more abundant, more sustainable? And so they do things like wind turbines, um, 
uh, engines, all kinds of engines, uh, train engines, other things. Um, and so just a few things about this. One is they've added, in 2012, they added $25 billion in revenue. And this division is at twi growing at twice the rate of the company. Now, th while they've been doing this, they also reduced their absolute greenhouse gas emissions by 32%. That's not emissions per dollar sold, that's total emissions. And you know, when you hear the heads of this division talk, um, you know, they, they say that, that it's wonderful. First of all, they talk about, you know, green is green, as in you will make a lot of money, or if uh, they were talking about if you were selling in China, green is red, right, because you will make a lot of money as well. Um, and, and it's not about just reducing emissions per dollar, because if you grow, then you just simply emit more. But it's about reducing absolute emissions. Oh, and by the way, this division, if it was on its own, would be a Fortune 150 company. Right, so it would be in the top 150 companies uh, in the U.S. Um, it is not only about big companies, though. There are startups all over the globe that are using this. And Grameen Bank is another great example. And they were talking, working with Micro Enterprise and at the base of the pyramid. Right? And everyone knows the story of Mohammed Yunus, Nobel Prize winner. Um, and you know, Grameen is really responsible for the, the micro lending revolution that is going on all over the globe. Um, and in fact, they have loaned over $11 billion to over uh, 8 million clients from 83 to 2011. Um, and they have been profitable all except for three years since their founding. Right? And, so, and the other thing that is incredible when you think about this is you know, they are loaning to the poorest of the poor and they have a 97% repayment rate. Now, if you compare that to what happened during the mortgage crisis in the US, lending to supposedly the most credit worthy people in the world, um, when you had a double digit rate of default, um, it, it's even more impressive. So again, this is not only talking about giant companies, but this is about how are people changing the world around them. And if, and if you listen, and um, I had the pleasure of hearing Mohammed Yunus speak uh, a while ago, and he talks about you know, they, that uh, Bangladesh is going to meet their goals, uh, their UN goals for poverty reduction, lo mostly as a result of this. Um, in marketing, regenerative marketing, L.L. Bean, which also ha which happens to be a main based company that has a large presence in Japan, and there's L.L. Bean Japan as well. Um, in where I live in Acadia National Park, uh, L.L. Bean spends uh, millions of dollars a year sponsoring these island, this island explorer bus system. Now, there are, I, I believe they take in something along the lines of uh, five million plus trips and reduce, uh, you know, um, an enormous amount of greenhouse gas emissions. And so what you can do is park your car and you can hop on these buses, they're free. And what L.L. Bean gets is they get their name on the side of the bus and they get exposure to about two to four million people a year who are their customers who are in a national park because they want to be enjoying the natural beauty. And so they're spending their marketing dollars not on TV ads, but on actually making the world a better place. Now, one of my favorites that's just recently come to light is this billboard, um, which I believe is in Argentina. Now, talk about regenerative marketing. This billboard actually produces oxygen. Um, and so what it is doing, and they put up the billboard, and you can see here the, the tree they have on here with the, it's a little bit fuzzy, but you can see the O2 um, bubbles. And so this is actually taking in pollution uh, from an urban area with, where there's tons of construction and dust and other things going on. And that billboard is actually, it was put out by an engineering school. And so they're getting the notoriety as a result of having the billboard. But the billboard is actually cleaning the air around them. So the one idea to deal with pollution would be to put these up in urban areas. And so you have marketing dollars, again, being spent doing what marketing is supposed to do, making people aware of the product, but spending the money in such a way that it is a net positive for society and the environment. Now, um, one of the most interesting areas that's happening is in the whole sharing economy or the solutions economy. Um, now, a couple of companies that you, you may have heard of, uh, Google being one of them, Right? This is how they do all of their services. You don't buy email from Google or, or Google Drive or whatever. It's all a shared platform. Uh, Netflix operates on this principle. People are using this in industries all over the world, saying you don't have to own the product. 
You just have to use it when you want. Um, and also there are other companies like Airbnb and Uber um, which are facilitating sharing between individuals. Um, and this is some of the most exciting stuff going on now in business. From a business model perspective, um, this totally flips things around. So instead of selling you a product that I then want to expire so you come back and buy another product, suddenly what you've done from a business perspective is you have aligned the needs of the consumer and the needs of the enterprise, right? And customers come back time and time again. Um, and it's, in these best, it's in these companies' best interest to make their products and their services last as long as they can, be updatable, um, and to be as efficient as they can to provide the customers the service. So let's just take a look for a minute at what Airbnb is doing. So they have revolutionized the hotel industry. And so this is a, imagine this, this is a company that didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, and you know, so last night, 40,000 people rented accommodations and services uh, that offered 250,000 rooms in 30,000 cities in 192 countries, right? This didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, and so it's enabling people to um, use their, their houses or apartments and um, create another income stream. Uber, which uh, for those of you who are from Europe, there were just huge protests in Europe uh, over Uber because they have changed around the way that people get rides. And so what happens is with Uber, you just, you put in your location, uh, they send a car to you, you can track the car, you get an email receipt, you don't have to pay cash. Now Uber would just got a, an investment of $1.2 billion, right? And it, not because they're a taxi company, right? But because they figured out how to facilitate this exchange between people in a way that makes it seamless for the customer. So their valuation right now, they're a four or five year old company, okay? Their valuation based on their investment was $18.2 billion. Now, there are a few companies you may have heard of. Sony, right here, around 16 billion. Alcoa Aluminum, United, is around 18 billion dollars. Um, and so what people are investing in here and what uh, enterprise is seeing is this is a revolutionary way of reaching the customer and they have they believe that uber has cracked the code now of course like every uh, enterprise um, because you're doing this does not it's not a panacea it doesn't mean you won't go out of business you still have all the normal business issues to contend with but these models are really revolutionizing what is happening out there now, um, the other thing that, the, another big area is the crowdfunding and crowdsourcing, and people are using that. Um, there's a company in the US called Mosaic, and they're crowdsourcing solar. And so people can invest in solar projects from all over, all over the country um, and, and get, a, a, get an, an annual return on that investment. Uh, Hotel Chocolat, which is a British company, raised $8 million from its customers, and they're paying them back in chocolate as an interest payment. Uh, Kickstarter, uh, which is a U.S. crowdfunding platform, has just recently crossed the billion dollars in funding threshold, right? And again, these did not exist, you know, five, ten years ago. So let's move on to this last piece here of, of unsold production. And this is another one that is just revolutionizing what is happening out there. So uh, this woman here is from, is from China. And uh, her name is Zhang Yin, and she's the richest woman in China, worth about four to five billion dollars. Um, does anyone know? So this is this is a great story. Just talk about the innovation and perspective piece. So here is how she made all of that all of that money. She went to the U.S., which is we are extraordinarily wasteful, right? And and um, and she used our waste to found this company, Nine Dragons Paper. Uh, and so this is what she did. She gathered up our cardboard and waste that we didn't want, that we were throwing out in the U.S., sending it back on empty ships to China, remanufacturing it into cardboard, and guess where it ended up? Back in the U.S., where she just kept repeating the cycle. And so the beautiful thing here from a business point of view is when you're looking at unsold production, this is stuff that is, generally speaking, free and you can reduce, if you start understanding that there is value there and value that has been hidden from other people, you can have a tremendous competitive advantage. Um, 
And companies are using this, just to, just to finish this piece up, companies are using this all over the world. There's another company in New Zealand called Lanza Tech that is basically doing this same thing, but they're harvesting uh, emissions from smokestacks and getting chemicals out of them um, and then using those chemicals and selling them back to industry. Now, so I want to just go through briefly the process that we've been talking about here. So to create abundance, there's this five steps that, that we have come up with um, that, you can, that you can follow. And again, this is for any organization. First of all, why do you exist? You know, what is the purpose of what you're doing out there? You really need to understand that. Why, why, why are you around? And then what are you good at? What are you good at competitively? Um, how do you stand out from those people around you? And if you think about this um, in the nonprofit world, let's say, you know, the way Greenpeace works is very different than the way World Wildlife Fund works. They each do, the, they each do those tasks very differently. Then you can maximize your advantage using the abundance cycle and those tactics that we went through. You can, the idea here is what you are trying to do is to change your perspective. So you're looking at new solutions, innovating, identifying new kinds of customers. And what is happening, if you can take those tactics and say, what would it look like if we were a base of the pyramid company, if we were to do this? What would it look like if we reduced our, uh, our resource use by 90%? What about if instead of worrying about selling this product, it was a service we gave to people, we just provided them with the solution that they want. Um, and then the two pieces that we didn't, we didn't cover are, one is you have to communicate this with your language, the language of the company. So don't go in there and start talking about, wow, we're, you know, we're gonna save greenhouse gas emissions and we're gonna save all these trees and we're gonna do all this stuff. Use your strategy and communicate this with the language of whatever entity you're in, right? And respect the language that they've developed and so people can understand it. And then once you understand that and you're using that language, then pick a couple key things and implement those early wins. And then the fifth piece of this is you really want to measure your results and report those out and then keep repeating. And I, just one word about the measurement. I am not talking here about just simply measuring water use or carbon output. Measure the things that you're trying to achieve. Do not confuse with simply, you know, working on statistics like, okay, we have to reduce carbon, which is a great thing, but don't confuse statistics with strategy, right? And so what you want to do is measure how well you're doing and don't have a predetermined outcome because it will likely be benefits that you have never seen or never thought of and you don't want to constrict that conversation. So the other piece of this, what we've done is there is a whole canvas, and I don't know if, there may be folks in here who are familiar with the business model canvas um, that is sweeping the startup world right now. We have created this canvas for the abundance cycle. And what you have over here is you have the listing of, of here are all the pieces, what is happening in inbound operations and all those primary activities, as well as the things that are being done to support. You can chart out what you're doing within your company or enterprise, uh, be it for-profit or non-profit. Um, and you can figure out where are you competitively strongest. Uh, then you can incorporate those three Ps. And we've listed those same bullet points that I showed in the presentation. So you, so you can remember, what am I actually trying to do here? And then you can list your implementation ideas over here. And as well, I, I did forget to mention that you, the comp, you can start up here by putting in the company purpose. So it'll help step you through it. You can download it. It's a big one-page sheet, so you can plan it all out and have it out there and be visible and move things around. Um, and you can, you can find this all at uh, theabundancecycle.com. If you're interested in reading more about this, there are several articles on Triple Pundit. And as well, here is my contact information, and I would be uh, more than happy to talk to you about it in length. This, is only, uh, this presentation has about 120 slides in it, so there are examples from all over the world of this happening in economies large and small, developed, developing, um, and there are many areas in which folks in uh, Africa and Asia are way ahead of what is happening in the more developed economies because they have to be, uh, by necessity, more creative and come up with new solutions. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.